What uh, I'd like to do next is actually uh, uh, introduce the next speaker, Rami Khoury. Uh, Rami is an internationally syndicated uh, political columnist and a book author. He's the first director of the Issam Fadis Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at American University in Beirut. He serves as a non-resident senior fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and at the Dubai School of Government. He's the editor at large and former executive editor of the uh, Beirut-based Daily Star. And he was awarded the Pax Christie International Peace Prize in 2006. As the author of The Future of Arab Youth, Innovative Innovations and Solutions, he's well positioned to give us his remarks to kick off this next section. So, Rami, please. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Thank you all for being here and thank you to the organizers for organizing this and for inviting me. I'm honored and uh, very happy to to be here and share some thoughts with you. Um, my thoughts, my comments will follow on very logically from everything we've heard uh, before and really what I'd like to do is uh, just uh, maybe uh, throw out some ideas, um, some uh, thoughts, uh, reflections in a way on uh, where we are in the Arab world today, uh, what is going on in terms of the uh, Arab uprisings. I, I don't like the word Arab Spring. Um, I, I ask everybody I meet from Libya and Syria and Tunisia and Egypt and all the other countries that are undergoing significant change, I ask them all, what are you doing? What do you call yourselves? What is it that you are involved in? And without exception, they all say we're, we're involved in the thawr and the revolution. And that may be too strong a word, revolution, but spring is too soft a word. Um, this isn't a seasonal transition. Uh, this is a massive historical change. Uh, 4,200 years ago, in the city-state of Lagash in Mesopotamia, is the first time in recorded human history that the word freedom was documented in the archaeological record. It was in our region of the word world that the word freedom came into the vocabulary of human history. And today, I believe, it is again this part of the world that is providing a new vocabulary for the next phase of human history. And it's not an accident that in Europe and in uh, in the United States and even in Israel recently and in other places where there's thousands and thousands of people out in the streets, somebody will tell you about Tahrir Square. Somebody will tell you about Muhammad Bouazizi. Somebody will tell you about the indomitable spirit of human beings who are ready not only to manifest their grievances and their aspirations uh, and their rights, but they're also willing even to risk their lives. And many have paid with their lives. Uh, and we, we, we remember and honor those in Libya, and Tunisia, and, and, and Egypt, and other places in the Arab world where many have died. Uh, and we hope that no more, no more will die. But this is a process of, of historic magnitude. And if we're looking at the link between education and employment, I think we need to understand it in its proper context. And I want to give you a couple of thoughts about what I think the context is, because if we want to try to look ahead, and my task was to try to look ahead and suggest ideas for, for the future, if we want to look ahead, we have to really understand where we came from and where we are right now, to understand uh, this linear, uh, linear process. And to do that, we need to look uh, far beyond project ideas, or even policy changes. I think we need to understand a complete change in the mindset and the attitudes of, of individuals, of families, of societies, and of governments. And this is a process that is being driven for the first time in my life, for the first time in the last three generations. It's a process that is being driven by Arab men and women, and most of them initiated by young Arab men and women. And we know from very good research that has been done uh, by groups that uh, Tarek mentioned, the, uh, the work that he's been involved with, the Middle East Youth Initiative, the Bicycle of Government, uh, Silitech, 
uh, many other groups, the World Bank, AUB, uh, people in the Gulf uh, here in various uh, the Brookings and uh, in Georgetown and many places around the, the Doha, you know, uh, Qatar University, many people have been involved in small uh, peaceful, uh, in, uh, not small, but uh, separate piecemeal projects. But when you put all this stuff together, especially with the recent polling that Silatech and Gallup have done, we know very well, which we didn't know 20 years ago, but we know very well today what drives the sentiments of young people. And more important than that, we know that the sentiments of young people are virtually identical to the sentiments of adults. So I think we need to um, look broadly first at what's going on in order to then uh, move forward and come up with, uh, try to think of practical ideas about addressing these momentous issues of how do we find 30, 40, 50, 60 million jobs, whatever it is we need for the next generation and this generation of young Arabs uh, to find a gainful, a productive, uh, dignified, and satisfying employment. Um, so the first, I'll just make a few, a few points. The first point I would make is that we have to start by looking at young people in a completely different way. Uh, because the simple fact is, it's no longer a situation where we look at young people, look at society, look at the education system, look at the job market. It's no longer a situation where we're trying to help them find jobs. They have turned our world upside down. And we are racing to catch up with the young people. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that we catch up with what our young people are doing and where they are leading us, because they are now leading the process of change throughout the region. And so the first thing we have to do is uh, understand the relationship between people under the age of 30 and people above uh, the age of 30. It's no longer a situation where adults are trying to make the world of young people better. Uh, the situation has been actually totally reversed. The second point I would make is we have to make a more serious effort to listen to and understand what young people are saying. When I say young people, I'm talking about under the age of 30, more or less. We have to really understand what they're saying in terms of their concerns, their grievances, and their aspirations, the, both the positive and the negative things. We just completed a two and a half year study of young people across the Arab world, which we've done with the UNICEF regional office in Amman, and about 50 or 60 scholars from all around the Arab world and some from overseas. We've held meetings uh, in, uh, in the Gulf and Egypt and Tunis and Amman and Beirut. We've, we've consulted with um, hundreds of people across the region. And we've come up with a study that's going to be published Friday. You'll be able to see it on our website or the UNICEF website. And, and it's uh, going to be a study that will provide a lot of insights into um, the mindset uh, of young people, how young people see themselves, what are the issues that bother them, and what is it that they want. Uh, and there isn't one group of young people, there's a wide variety of people. In fact, there's two Arab worlds, essentially. There are the wealthy states, mostly here in the Gulf, where the needs of young people and of adults are largely taken care of by the state. Education, healthcare, housing, etc., jobs are pretty much taken care of um, for most of the people. Um, and there is a sense of social equity and, and dignity and uh, composure in society, um, which creates very few problems of social turbulence or, or political protest or anything like that. And then there's the rest of the Arab world, uh, the other 310 million Arabs where the complete opposite is the situation, where there is uh, huge uh, problems of uh, unemployment, underemployment, uh, low income, uh, basic human needs are not sufficiently met, um, lack of dignity, lack of opportunity. Um, and so there's, there's a wide range of, uh, of views uh, across the region, uh, but broadly the Arab world splits up into these two groups. And if you look across the region, I would mention four key points that come out of our study. There's many others, but four, the most important four that I think we need to pay attention to when looking at young people. Uh, first, what are they 
what do they want and what are they concerned about? They want the space and the freedom uh, to express themselves and their identity more completely. They're law-abiding, they're sensitive to the values of their society, they love and obey their parents, they respect their neighbors, they're faithful to their religious traditions, they're good citizens, but they want more space and opportunity to manifest their identity, whatever that identity, that identity may be, cultural, political, social, whatever it is. Second thing is they want more opportunities to develop their interests and their abilities. They want to be able to have more opportunities if they want to get into a certain field of work or artistic or, or sports or whatever uh, it may be. So the first one, the space and the freedom, I would call it the issues of identity. Uh, the second one, uh, the opportunity to develop, I would call it options. They want more, uh, more options. The third one, they want to be treated more fairly. They feel that, that many young people feel they're not treated fairly in society, that, that some people have more advantages than other people, uh, whether because of Wasta or because of uh, uh, their social standing or their wealth or whatever it is, they feel that there are inequities in society. Uh, and uh, so they want to be treated more fairly and that's what I would call justice, a sense of justice. And fourth, they want to have their voices heard. They don't necessarily want to run society, but they just want to be taken seriously. They want to have their voices heard, and they want to be, they have ideas, they have complaints, they have suggestions, they have proposals, they have constructive criticisms, and they want to be heard. Those four things, and I would call that participation. So identity, options, justice, and participation are the four key themes that I think we have to look at at young people today. And we should, in retrospect, look back and realize these issues are not issues that came out of Tahrir Square. These issues came out of years and years of research by scholars all across the region. And we had identified all these ones, we got all these scholars together and talked to young people and analyzed the available data. And what we discovered also a year and a half ago, before uh, December 2010, is that what young people were actually doing, because these four complaints were not addressed by their societies, they were creating parallel worlds, parallel societies, uh, digitally on the web, with their cell phones, in the souk, in the, in the mall, in the mosque, in the neighborhood, in the schoolyard, walking out on the street, there were hundreds of thousands of parallel societies that young people had created very quietly without disrupting society and doing these four things that they were not allowed to do by the rest of society. And they broke through these constraints in a way that didn't totally upset society before the Arab uprisings began. And if you look at these things together, what is it that they want? They want essentially to be, they want citizenship. They want to be citizens. They don't want to be young people. They don't want to be students. They want to be citizens. They want to be members of society who contribute to society. Second thing they want is a society that is organized more on the basis of the rule of law. Um, and broadly speaking, the rule of law. In other words, they want to live, they want sovereignty. They want to live in societies where sovereignty, sovereignty actually matters, where they have control of their lives, where they contribute uh, to society. And what they've done in the last uh, 10, 11 months is act, many of them have actually risked their lives to, to achieve this. And to get a stable and satisfying form of sovereignty in their lives and in their societies. I think we can again look back and say, what are the three critical elements that we see all across the demonstrations in the Arab world, in every country, Bahrain, Yemen, Syria, a little bit in Jordan, a few in Morocco, and then the three countries that were governments were changed, uh, in all across the Arab world, even countries where you didn't have open demonstrations, but petitions were sent to the leadership and low-key kinds of uh, demands, 
were made. Three things stand out that are common to every one of these countries. The demand for citizenship and citizenship rights, the demand for constitutional reforms. People don't want promises. They don't want a speech by a political leader. They don't want interviews in the newspaper. They want constitutional reform. They want the rule of law that guarantees them rights and mechanisms to enforce that. And the third thing they want is social justice. In every one of these uh, countries, people are asking for social justice. They want to be treated fairly and they want to make sure that everybody starts life with a minimum equal opportunity. These three issues, citizenship, constitutional reform, and social justice, provide, I believe, the conceptual and the practical foundations for looking ahead. So I finished with where we come from now. I'll finish uh, uh, just seven more minutes on about where we're going. But we can only know where we're going if we understand this foundation, because hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of young people have risked their lives to achieve these goals. And they're starting to achieve them. Slowly, hopefully, um, they will succeed. But in order to move ahead, we need to have this practical foundation of common values uh, that then allow each society, according to its own traditions and needs and priorities and assets, to make the policy changes uh, that are needed uh, to move ahead. Um, so I think looking ahead, uh, the first thing we have to do is look, I believe, at if we're looking, if we're talking about job creation mainly and the education to work uh, transition, I think we have to look at employment policy and economic policy more than youth policy. The problem is, is jobs and economic policy, not youth policies. Uh, the second thing uh, we have to do is stop talking about youth and start talking about young citizens. I think we need to understand that important sort of philosophical change is uh, that we're, we're not talking about young people that need our help to move on to the next stage of their life. We're talking about how do you tap the energy the knowledge, the creativity, the power of, of something like 100 million people under the age of 30, most of whom have access to schooling, most of whom can walk to a medical center and have clean water, and that their basic needs are pretty well met, more or less, with some disparities here and there. So we need to get away from the idea of, of youth who need our help to the idea of this massive power that has already shown what it can do at the political level. When you deal with some of the governments that have been changed or are being challenged, and you see the enormous power and determination of young people to lead adults with them, uh, we can understand that they can certainly come up with the ideas and the power necessary to address a rather simple thing like creating enough jobs. The third point I'd say is we have to break free from the constraints, the twin constraints, of looking at labor markets and education system. I think this has been a trap. I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm not smart enough to be an economist. But I'm a journalist. I've been a, I've been a journalist all my life. And, and I've watched this process for the last 42 years in the Arab world, mostly in the Levant, but also traveling around the region. And people are talking today about the same things they were talking about 40 years ago in the early 70s. How do you make the education system meet the needs of the job market? Well, if we haven't figured this out after two generations, I think we're asking the wrong question. So it's not a question of education and job uh, demands only. It's much uh, bigger than that because by addressing it the way we have, we have failed at both ends of the spectrum. We haven't solved the job problem and we haven't created the education system that we need. So I think we should start asking some better questions. The fourth thing is, I believe, we have to listen to youth and teachers. I believe teachers, school teachers, from kindergarten up to college, 
and vocational training, all the, everybody who's a teacher, are probably the single biggest untapped resource that we have in addressing this issue. And we need to listen to both the young people and the students, our young citizens, and the teachers more carefully to, to, to not repeat the mistake we made in the last two generations, which is not to listen to them. Because they're telling us, if you, when we did the research for our youth report with UNICEF, we found tons of material in newspapers, in interviews, to, by talking to people on the web, in every possible, and polls, everywhere you look, the information was there. But people were not listening. People were not looking to really hear what young people were saying. So we need to not make that mistake again. The fifth thing, I believe, is to explore a new foundational partnership. And I say foundational, meaning at the very foundation, the very basis of addressing this issue. That would include educators, families, students, the state, the government, and the private sector. Those five elements have to work together. They can only work together at the community and the local level. So I think if we cr try to explore this kind of foundational uh, partnership, we will start coming up with the uh, operational mechanism by which at every level, family, schooling, jobs, government, etc., people can uh, and this youth expressing themselves, we can start to find openings to um, solve these problems at their beginning, which is young people being able to get onto a track that will lead them to interesting, satisfying, uh, productive uh, work. I think in this respect, uh, one of the possibly biggest untapped uh, resources we have Zamila mentioned uh, internships, which I think are incredibly important, but I think even more profound is possibly to explore the idea uh, of uh, the Parent Teachers Association. I think the Parent Teachers Association in the Arab world, and if you bring in the private sector at the local level, can be possibly the single most uh, decisive, accurate, and productive way to start bringing together the opportunities that come from the talents of young people, the power of the education system, and the needs of the labor market. So Parent Teachers Association at the local level with the business component, and the businesses will often be parents, I think has to be explored very seriously. Six point, and it was mentioned in our opening speaker, one of the slides was, I thought it was really interesting, he said you have to I can't remember exactly what it was. So you have to have fun. You have to enjoy yourself. You have to find what interests you. And it's absolutely true. And, and I think we need to recognize and tap and develop the talents of young people at an early age, at a very early age. The enthusiasm, the energy, and the education of an engaged young citizen is probably the fastest way to address these issues that we're trying to address of job creation and economic productivity and stability. The enthusiasm, energy, and education of engaged young citizens. And finally, I would say the last point is we need to leave that, get out of that stuck, that area we're stuck in, that middle tier, where we're working between the top level of the state and the bottom level of the citizen, and we're stuck in the middle, and we're not making any progress. And I think we have to go back and look at the state, and look at the citizen, and figure out how they can re-engage. 4,200 years ago, they started addressing that issue in Lagash in Mesopotamia. This year, we are fortunate to live through a historic reawakening of the concept of Arab freedom which is fundamentally grounded in the rebirth of, or maybe perhaps the birth for the first time, of the concept of Arab citizenship. I think that is where the solution lies, and that is where we should start looking. Thank you very much. Very well done. Thank you, Rami.
Um, we'd like to go now, and uh, in America, sometimes in college in particular, uh, we would occasionally talk about people being two-fisted drinkers. I've never been a two-fisted uh, speaker, but this is a good thing. You've got to do both of them for drinking. Okay. So uh, let's see. Can we have a, a couple of questions? We have a few minutes for questions for our speakers. Uh, either uh, either speaker is fine. Yes. And we uh, uh, tried to talk about uh, the needs uh, of the youth uh, in a regional context, and we talked about our spring uh, for several, uh, was mentioned several times. Uh, I think there is an additional dimension here, which is the global dimension, uh, where uh, the arms spring of started by the youth uh, is uh, a revolution or uh, a spring our spring is an uh, idea of the Bible and the uh, reservation of youth is using our spring. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, a, it's a revolution or an uprising uh, of uh, also Twitter, and, uh, Facebook, and YouTube, and all that. And we have seen that how the uh, Arab uh, uprising uh, has also affected other parts of the world uh, in that uh, protest that we see in Europe. So, there is this global dimension. Uh, my question is, uh, how does that affect to the aspirations of the youth and the, the, our, our, since this discussion is about our, uh, So we have seen the impact going from the region to the rest of the world. But uh, trying to, uh, uh, to answer the questions of uh, the needs of the, of the address, the needs of the youth in this region, uh, from a global perspective, how is that? To be um, thank you, Ibrahim. I think this is actually an amazing question because, I mean, in London right now, our government is struggling with the Occupy protest, where you know senior figures of the church have resigned because they're supporting this protest, and it's very rare in England that the church ever speaks out. But the fact is, is that it, the Arab Spring has somehow given young people all over the world a voice, not just in the Arab region. It's reminded young people of the value of speaking up when you think there's something wrong, or when, as you know, to use Rami's words, when there is something unfair and unjust going on. Um, and it's happening everywhere. I mean, in Portugal and Spain, we're seeing almost riots on the streets now of young people because of the level of unemployment and the level of debt the countries are in. Because young people know if your country is in debt, then there does, that means you have no future. If we can't pay back the debt that the government owes, then there's not going to be any jobs for you in the future. So it's true, young people are actually voicing their anger about jobs through these protests. And they started in the Arab world, and now they are global. Um, but what that means for the Arab Spring, it, it, in a sense, it's almost justifying you know, what has been happening, because we're not looking at it as a right or wrong, but we're seeing it as a continuum. This journey hasn't yet ended, and yet it's finding other voices, it's finding new countries. But at the same time, the voice is almost similar. It's about dissatisfaction, it's about unfairness. And it occurred to me, you know, in all the reading I've done about labor market reports, I've never seen a regional organization like the ILO or the UN, which also focuses on jobs, actually say we're going to have a massive summit for young people and we're, or we're going to do a huge wave of policy development that actually just involves young people. We almost have it always on the sidelines. So as Rami says as, as well, we've got to change the way we run our governments. They have to be more strategic. So you know, my first recommendation is, it's not just government that has to make policy. Policy is defined by the economy, by society, by citizens. But also, in a world where most of your population is under 30, it has to be defined by them too. So that's where we start. We have to now have more strategic engagement with young people at all levels. I'll just make a, one quick point, which is I, I, I don't think there's any really major difference in terms of the values that people have um, around the world. This is pretty clear now. Um, when you look at uh, what's going on and what people are asking for, um, why are there no big demonstrations in, uh, in Malaysia or in um, Sweden or in other places? Uh, probably because they pay more attention to social safety nets, to issues of social justice, citizen participation at some level, 
uh, and a nice balance in some cases between religiosity and individual liberty and collective identities. Um, and this happens because the people in those societies are involved in defining those societies. Because the concept, when the concept of citizenship is respected, um, the uh, development of society and the stability and the security of society um, are also protected. Thank you. Uh, second question. Yes, up in the back. Yes. Okay, hi. Um, all of, I, we've heard you guys stress over and over internships, internships, internships. But earlier, somebody, uh, I can't remember if it was earlier, but if we were talking, uh, you talked about um, career counseling offices having difficulties advertising seminars for students and having difficulties getting students to engage. I mean, wonderful, awesome speakers and four students show up. You two seem to have interviewed the most students population in this whole area. Have you gotten feedback for them? What are they looking for when they're looking for, what would you recommend to somebody who's trying to do something similar? How should I advertise? Who should I be recruiting as speakers? Yes. No, you're right. You're, it, there is an imbalance between where people access information about the labor market and how currently we are dealing with delivering that information. There are career services in every university. There is an outreach program here in Qatar for careers advisors to go into schools and make sure young people have. But the fact is, just because people are in education does not make them a captive audience. You have to find the best time to tap that and the best way to give that information. So when I ask young people how or what type of information is it you're looking for, they say, look, when we go to career fairs, the company tells us a little bit about themselves and about the graduate training program, but they don't tell us a lot about what the working environment looks like or how much I'm actually going to get paid or how long it's going to take me to get to management level or how it is I can informally talk to somebody. So it's about what kinds of information we're giving people. But also in terms of career services, in the UAE, for example, you know, the careers advisor told me at one university, you know, we send an email out to everybody telling them when it is that they can access a seminar or something. But students get hundreds of emails every day. That's not the best way you're going to tap into somebody. There are other methods to do it. So just because, as I said, they're there, then that does not make them a captive audience. But also the type of information you're giving them matters. So again, while we might think these speakers are globally important, young people might not. I mean, did anyone ever ask young people, who is it you think we should have as your role models, or who is it you would like to have as a speaker at our university? Maybe if we started it as a demand-led thing, then maybe young people might show up. So I think it's a demand-supply mechanism, how we access the material that they need, but also how we deliver it. So again, it's about listening to young people first and asking them, and then we know what it is we should be delivering because we don't always know what's best for young people. You obviously don't have teenage children. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're very reluctant to listen to what adults want to tell them anyway, so that might be part of the problem. And my question is about time. If time is on our side uh, to make use of what's happening in the Arab world into our advantage and make a positive impact. And the reason I ask this question is because I find what you said very accurate about uh, women's empowerment and strategic engagement of, of young uh, men and women in our country. There was an uprising, and I totally agree with, 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 with you that Rami is not an Arab spring, and I have not seen a spring in a month since, uh, since I was born. So it does not really relate, with, I cannot really relate to the word Arab spring. So the, the question is, if we have, after all of this has happened and all these positive changes, uh, we find that there is still change has to come from the top. And we have had two experiences that did not work very well for strategic engagement of women and young people. We have had parliaments in uh, elections in uh, Oman and UAE where young uh, 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 change makers and women were not able uh, to, to capitalize on the Arab uprising. So uh, it is time on our side because it looks like it's going to take a few years for us to be able to see positive changes. Thank you. These kinds of changes that we're talking about take time. Um, and it's clear that this is a long-term process. Um, you, if you look at political democratization, if you look at economic growth and um, social equity, uh, these things take a long time to uh, achieve a mature state and then to stabilize and be uh, perpetuated for a long time. 
but I think the important thing now is simply to recognize the forces that have been unleashed and the mechanisms that need to be um, uh, cemented. I think free expression is the first thing that we have to maintain. Uh, I think Todd had mentioned that to, to keep this space open. Uh, people need to, to work hard to keep that space open so that people can express themselves in a civil but honest and public way. The second thing is to explore how to create mechanisms of accountability, which are 100% compatible with Islamic tradition, Arab uh, tribal culture, modern constitutional law, uh, and any other standard that you want to uh, put, it up, put it up against. Accountability is absolutely uh, necessary so that people who exercise power are somehow held accountable to their own citizens. And it's up to every country to figure out the way to do it. Some people might do it through appointed councils of elderly people or young people's councils in, in schools or something in between or elected parliaments or in the media or, or, or the leader makes a tour around the country as happens in Oman. And there's many ways that accountability and free expression can happen. So I think we just need to identify uh, what is it that what is this force that's been unleashed and what, what do they want? And I, I, I said citizenship, uh, constitutional reform, and social justice seem to me from studying this process, those are everywhere. Everybody wants those things. And I think we just have to keep pushing for them. Uh, these uh, kinds of breakthroughs uh, are not uh, uh, quick and they're not cost free. Uh, people have died, thousands of people uh, have died. And, and people will long remember uh, the names of places like Misrata and uh, Dira and, and other places, the uh, Thais. These, these, these names will ring in our history uh, like Valley Forge rings in the history of the United States. Uh, these are uh, historical markers. Uh, and they're not historical markers only about political change, they're historical markers about human courage and, and the, the rights of citizens who struggled and fought, and in some cases paid with their lives to achieve uh, some of these goals. But we can perhaps uh, improve the chances of achieving uh, these goals uh, at the least possible cost uh, by pushing to maintain these issues of free expression and accountability and then let the society evolve at the pace that it wants to uh, work towards those goals. I totally agree with Ravi. I mean, this change always takes time. Revolutions can be quick, but real change that makes a difference to people's lives does take time. But there is always a risk, really, because, I mean, it's a sort of historical fact of countries where if democracy arrives, you know, you get, un you get high inflation, high unemployment, and lots of people leave because it takes a while for you to incorporate democratic values. But here, you know, young people have vested interests to stay, but we need to make sure that we don't, we don't find a reason for them to want to leave because if we don't stabilize countries soon, there will be reasons to leave, and young people and that brain drain will happen because these are young, motivated people who ultimately you know, want to give back to their community, but also want jobs and families like Tarek said. They want to progress their own lives as well. So I mean, I think personally that this is an opportunity for the Arab region itself to find a voice, because you may be nationalistic in this Arab Spring, but it's a cumulative effect that has happened. And um, you know, some countries have shown great leadership in this. Qatar has been one of them. But I think this is now time, if you are all experiencing similar things, you know, as a region, maybe start acting up a block, start acting more strategic about this and help each other, because not every country is as rich as some of the Gulf countries, but equally, a lot of the people that work in Gulf countries come in from the other Arab countries themselves, so you have a vested interest in making sure these things happen, because otherwise the risks are real, and history shows us that these risks do take place. Brain drain does happen after revolutions. People do leave countries. So, you know, riding high on the wave of momentum is a great thing but people will not wait for forever. So before things get uglier, we should make sure that, you know, as a block, we can support each other and make sure things happen. Thank you, Shane. We'll take uh, one final question. Yes. Uh, my name is Ahmad Gadi. I work at the HR 360 as a part of the Congress of Education. Um, I'm actually honored to be here as uh, part of the organizing committee. So I thank you all for being uh, our uh, distinguished speakers. My question is to Rami. Ramila, you're welcome to uh, comment also if you want. But um, 
Rani, I was intrigued by uh, a statement, I don't know how to call it a statement, a sentence you said about the connect or disconnect between labor market and education. Um, it seems like we are compartmentalizing labor education and somehow we're working very hard to link both. So, um, and they're both very important, uh, each on its, its own and together. Would you then um, call for a reform in education whereby uh, the educational systems across the board uh, will incorporate to a high level of importance, I think, uh, internships into the education system, uh, uh, policies as far as you, you uh, focus on PTAs. We touch on these here and there, but if we bring them together, do you think that we will be closer to achieving um, uh, the incorporation of youth and employment, rather than wait until they graduate from college or they graduate uh, high school and then lead them into uh, the labor market? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think we need to explore ways to bring together these different elements. I mentioned families, students, educators, private sector, and the state. And you can throw in their civil society if you want, but civil society cuts across all these. So I think those five elements strike me as absolutely crucial uh, players. And they all have to be involved in this process uh, together from a very early stage. That's why I say uh, exploring, for instance, how do you expand the Parent Teachers Association into something much more than that? I think there should be experiments, and this is where NGOs and, and people involved in this uh, forum and others can and, uh, facilitate, and uh, people in the universities, and everybody can play around, not play around, but experiment with ideas. How about a council of, say, you know, you take the top 10 companies in, uh, in Qatar, and why don't you get the director of human resources uh, from those top 10 companies and, and get, uh, say, high school principals from 20 leading high schools all around Qatar and a few universities and have them meet once a month for lunch and talk about this, the stuff they run into in their daily lives. I mean, I, I hire people uh, all the time and, and when I get young people, um, their education is almost completely meaningless to me. It depends on what, they, what their character is like. How hard working are they? Are they creative? Are they honest? Uh, are they dependable? Uh, do they give ideas? Are they, uh, do they have initiative? Um, these are factors that come from home, and they come from school, and they come from their sense of citizenship. If they feel that they have rights as citizens of a country, if they're six years old, they have rights to have entertainment in parks and to go to the safe play areas and to get good education. If they're 12 years old, if they're 18, if they're 27, they have rights at every one of those stages of life. And, and young people, uh, believe me, we just saw it, young people will passively acquiesce in the limits or denial of their rights for a certain period of time, but they won't do it forever. And what we've just seen uh, is young people bursting out of uh, uh, of these constraints. So I think we've got to find mechanisms whereby these institutions all exchange ideas, experiences, thoughts, and then let's see what uh, comes out of it. But absolutely, they must be dealt, uh, they must be, they must work together uh, more closely. Uh, and, and, and if there's one single most important thing that strikes me as the lessons that I've learned from this research over the last few years, uh, is simply to, to listen to what young people are saying, because they, they're telling us all the time and how they act, how they dress, what music they listen to, where they go to play, what they do after school, uh, how they use their blackberries. Um, they, they tell us what, this, what they want uh, and what, what they'd like to do. They, if we can identify simply their aspirations more clearly, then you're going to get much more productive, dynamic, energetic young workers when you give them a job in a field that they really enjoy. So, but this is tough because it means all society has to change. Uh, the, the parental system, the patriarchal system in society, uh, the controls on young people will evolve uh, slowly. But I believe uh, we have a good chance to do this in our societies because both the, the religious dictates and the social traditions are very strong 
And young people are not rebelling against uh, those fine traditions that define the Arab world. Uh, they're rebelling against the denial of their rights as citizens. Some of the young women I spoke to said, look, you know, I want to work, but I also want to make my parents proud of me and I want to make them happy. And they, I got two very interesting examples. One was actually here at the Brookings office when we were recruiting for an intern. At the interview day, one woman brought her mother with her to the interview. And her mother sat in the interview and just let, watched her daughter give the interview. And you know, we thought it was just fascinating. We didn't know she was coming. But the young woman felt more comfortable if her mother knew what was going on. If she got this job, her mother needed to feel comfortable in that environment that she was going to be in. And as Rami said, you know, and this young woman was happy with that culture, with that tradition, to make sure that prolonged. In the UAE, at a think tank, a young woman got a job, and her mother came with her to the office every day for two months. And the think tank didn't know what to do, whether they should support this or talk about it or interact with it in any way. And then one day the mother just stopped coming and they asked the young woman, why has your mother stopped coming? She goes, oh, because she likes me here now. She goes, before she wasn't sure, so she needed to feel satisfied. And I needed to her to feel satisfied because we don't want young women, you know, going against their family to ask, you know, get their aspirations, but then going home and then, you know, feeling uncomfortable in the family home. This is a reality that people face every day. So as Rami said, you know, society is going to have to change. But that it isn't a force to push against. It's something that young people want to support their families in. And I mean, one thing, I literally this week have been invited to sit on a board in England called the Education and Employers Task Force, where employers are now going to talk to teachers directly and say, what is it that we can help you with to make sure your job is easier so that your students understand what we need better and this is outside of government completely. It's a completely middle level thing, which is the market is correcting itself. It's saying, we need to find better ways to make sure that internships work, that young people get those internships, that we get the people that we want. Because, I mean, the big disconnect between education and employment, just quickly, is social mobility. You can be the brightest person on the planet, but if you don't have social capital or vasta, you are not going to get the best job that you wanted. So we need to find ways to overcome those things as well. So society does need to change. Thank you. Yeah. Just to, to allow me to wrap it up briefly with a couple of observations, and I'll, uh, I'll start with a simple story first. Um, an American humorist and journalist and writer in the uh, 19th century, Mark Twain, uh, when, when, when a writer uh, was interviewing him and noticed that he was no longer smoking, he said, you quit smoking. Was it easy or was it hard? And Mark Twain said, no, it's easy. I've done it hundreds of times. <laughs> and the problem that we all face with any change is not the, the intellectual recognizing the need for change. It's actually sustaining the change that makes it better. Not talking about it, not theorizing about it, not feeling about it, but actually doing something about it. And that work, by all accounts, is hard work. It always has been and it always will be. Effecting change is hard work. Now, in the countries that brought us here, perhaps in some way, in terms of seeing things happen in the last year, year and a half in Tunisia, in Egypt, Libya, Syria, and now some things going on in Italy and the Occupy movements in, in the United States and in, in the UK and all over the world, they often started most with those most egregious violators of a principle people talk about here in both sessions, that's equity, some sense of justice, some sense of fairness. And those were the places it came out most loudly and people did, in fact, risk their lives and lost their lives, many. But even in some of the most advanced democracies in the, in the world, you hear the voices and they're saying the same things. And so when you, when you listen to that, Fundamentally, I think it comes down to young people looking for a voice, looking for dignity, and looking for participation. And to take action on that, I think there were some good points throughout, but I think one of the ones that struck me was separating employment policy from economic policy, from education policy, and working on all of them. Taking the hard actions to address what can we do to improve these things, but also, how do we get the participation of the voice in this process? 
So I, I want to thank you all very much, but especially I want to thank Zamila and Rami for being great panelists here. And we'd like to turn it over to Mayor Rahani, who's going to uh, lead us to the welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. This has been a fascinating afternoon and beginning of the evening. Uh, superb speakers. Um, and I would like to start by thanking the organizations that put this together, Qatar Foundation and the Qatar Career Fair Center, and in particular, Mr. Lang Mansouri, the head of the center. Of course, GE Foundation, and in particular, the president and the chairman of GE Foundation, but also Krista Bauer, and also GE representative in the Middle East. I don't know where he is. Uh, yes, here. Thank you. Thank you. And my colleagues at FHI 360. Thank you all for organizing that. In the name of the organizers, I want to give the organizers a clap. Thank you. The advertising has unleashed a powerful sea of change. However, for change to be sustainable, it has to become a reform and a transformation. Change alone is not sufficient. Change is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. We need to transform societies, and hopefully we need to, trend, to sustain that transformation. For transformation to happen, what I heard today are insights and analysis that would help us all, I think, move forward for transformation to happen. It needs certain conditions. One of them is it cannot happen without inclusion. Inclusion of men and women. Many speakers talked about that. Inclusion of young citizens. Inclusion of voices that we usually did not give enough importance to. We need to listen more carefully to each other, to listen and respect the different perspectives, and recognize that diversity in perspectives is what enriches our societies. Uniformity does not. Uniformity can oppress. Diversity is what enriches. We also heard today that the multifaceted aspect of solutions is part of the solution. There is no silver bullet. Solution is multifaceted. And part of that multifacetedness is the fact that there are or there is a multiplicity of players all important. That multiplicity of players includes the young citizens, the government, the parents, the NGOs, the think and do tanks, the INGOs, and others. Together, it's not an either or. No solution happens with an either or. Together, they can find the solution. Another aspect that we heard is that for that solution to happen and be sustainable, there is a value system that we need to respect and we, do, we need to support and reinforce. That value system recognizes the importance of identity for young and old, but maybe specifically for the young, the young citizens, because they're asking for it asks for a respect for justice and equity, which also includes inclusion, men and women, and asks for a total respect and recognition of the importance of voice, and voice of the young citizens, again, for them to be empowered to allow the change to become transformation. So that value system will sustain, if we allow it to be woven into the solution, and if we allow the multiple players 
to work with that family system, including the young citizens, then that might allow the transformation to happen and might allow it to be sustained. And finally, my final remark is to say that the, the reawakening of the Arab citizens, young Arab citizens, and of freedom is infectious in a very positive way, and it's influencing the world. And my hope that it will transform the Arab society, but it will also transform the image of the world about the Arab society. Thank you. Not going to stay for long. أنا أول حاجة بتكلم بالعربي أنا لي شرفني بديت بالعربي وعندي بالعربي بما أن إحنا يعني فعلا تأثير الثورات العربية واللقاءات العربية أن إحنا فعلا لدينا الآن هذه هذه خلينا نقول تواصل حضارات اللي تسعى له دائما قطر وتسعى له يعني إن شاء الله تعالى مؤسسات قطر أيضا باسم المنظمين مؤسسات قطر جي إي فونديشن اف اتش أي 360 أنا أشكر أيضا المتحدثين وأشكر وأشكر رؤساء الجلسات على ما قدموا من مواضيع، ما في شك ان المواضيع اللي تناقشنا فيها اليوم ما هي الا يعني خلينا نقول يعني يعني قشور وقشور صراحة لانه يعني حتى المواضيع اللي ناقشناها وحتى اللي تم العناوين اللي تم اختيارها ما في شك انها يعني تحتاج كثير من النقاش، تحتاج كثير من البحث، يمكن في خصوصيات كل دولة على حدة، ايضا يمكن الدكتور رامي وزع الدول العربية او او وزع تقريبا المنطقة العربية الى 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 جزئين، الان صارت اجزاء كثيرة دكتور يعني الان عقب الثورة تونس غير، مصر غير، ايضا ليبيا غير وغيرها من 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 الدول، فانا ان شاء الله تعالى احنا يعني ان شاء الله تعالى هذه بداية خلينا نقول سلسلة من الندوات ان شاء الله تعالى والحوارات والنقاشات اللي نحاول قد ما استطاع نقدم يعني ما نعتقد ان ان شاء الله تعالى يدعم الجميع، لا اريد اطيل عليكم، انا اشكر صراحة جميع من حضر اليوم خصيصا اللي جاوا من من خارج قطر خصيصا لهذه الندوه وايضا الموجودين معنا من قطر اشكر الجميع شكرا لكم بارك الله فيكم <تصفيق>